good afternoon, everybody. I'm Tina Brock, the host of Into the Absurd, and we are here today uh, and going to have a, a, a wonderful conversation in the next 50 minutes with Dr. Beverly Shin. Dr. Shin is uh, at New York uh, Presbyterian Hospital Weill Cornell. She is a, a resident there in psychiatry, and I'm also super excited to talk to her about her work. Um, and her many, many years as a concert violinist. So we're going to talk about the ways in which these things merge um, and when they and how they come together and the way in which art and music and psychiatry blend. So Dr. Beverly Shin, welcome to Into the Absurd. Hi, Tina. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to chat with you more. Yeah, yeah. Well, our conversation started, I think, as we were discussing, um, uh, we know each other from way, way back because uh, <laughs> your husband and I used to work together at the National Board, Jesse Delaney. And so we have, uh, you used to come to IRC shows. So that's a way in which we found uh, a common, a common, a common place with each other. So um, there's so much to talk about today, but let's start back in the early days of, um, of Beverly Shin's life. And something that was so beautiful, I, I felt, um, talked about listening to your brother. Was it your brother when you yeah. were very, very young? And when he would play the piano, that wasn't uh, as, as it didn't strike you in the same way as when he played violin. And I love your quote is, I just had to be near him. And I want to know, what was it about that? What was it about? Was it something in him? Or was it something in you? Or was it a combination of both? I think it was probably a combination of both. And then maybe also just that, I don't know how conscious this was at the time, but I mean, I think, I don't know, the violin has just such a vocal quality about it. So I think maybe there was something about that that I was really drawn to. Um, I don't remember it super well. I just yeah. remember <laughs> being really, really captivated by the violin and wanting to just be in the room or... I'm sure he was not as thrilled about it, but yes, <laughs> wanting to be near him, wanting to be in the room. Um, mm -hmm. And so your family, your your mother was a, a, a an opera. Uh, yes, yeah, my mother trained as a as a singer, as a classical singer. Mm -hmm. And was your father um, musical as well, or? So um, my father is an engineer. Um, so less so. <laughs> maybe accounts for the other half of my life, maybe yeah. a little bit more. Yeah. So uh, you're back here <clears throat> performing and very early on you, you, you take to the violin, not at two and a half, but later on, right? You, you were studying and by the time you were a teen, you were actually um, performing, right? Performing in concerts and had income coming in based on, on, uh, on your violin. And something you wrote which is fascinating <clears throat> like sports it's you're in it and you are a student as you're as you're progressing right? yes you're... absolutely and do you think that um where what was it about that life you you, you decided to go to school tell us about um the choice to attend you were at the cleveland conservatory is that right yeah, so I, I had sort of a much, I had a very winding path. I mean, I think um, I will start by saying, maybe answering the first piece of this, which is, um, I think one of the things that definitely prompted me to choose, initially anyway, music as a career was really, um, I felt like being around musicians, I was with my people, right? There was mm -hmm. something about... Um, yeah, other people who were willing to put in a ridiculous amount of time to do this thing that was so, you make this noise and it goes away. <laughs> like, I don't know, there was something Don Quixote-like about people putting all of this effort into something that was really just going to disappear. Um, and it was classical music, and a lot of my friends were not listening to classical music. It's not something that um, was really pervasive, I think, in, or isn't in pervasive in popular culture. So yeah, there was something about finding other people who loved it as much as I did. And um, so yeah, I think that was a big piece of it, sort of getting a chance to kind of be with my tribe. Um, mm -hmm. But yeah, so initially, I, um, 
actually had a brief stint at the Curtis Institute of Music. So that was kind of in Philadelphia. So that was the first time I lived in Philadelphia. Um, was at the University of Pennsylvania then for two years after that, um, because I had a lot of indecision. It was very hard for me to decide even then whether I wanted to um, pursue more of an academic life or if I wanted to have the life of a performer, I ended up going with the life of a performer first, figuring that um, muscle memory and what lives in your body kind of has to be programmed in earlier rather than later. And if I was going to end up, I mean, I had no idea then that I would end up doing what I'm doing now. Um, but part of the process, part of the thought process was, okay, I'm not sure what to do now, but this I kind of have to do now if I'm going to do it. And these mm -hmm. other things um, will be more of an option later. So I took the plunge. Um, mm -hmm. When you say that, you know, in the, the Don Quixote part where you jumped in and you were like, I just love being out there with a bunch of people that were doing the same thing I was, and you say it, it disappeared. Is that the, the unique nature of live performances that you do it and then, and then it's gone? Is that? I mean, I think so. I, 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 it's not something I thought about maybe until later. I mean, once, once I was, when I was in my twenties and I would say early thirties and actively performing and traveling and doing all that, I found myself very drawn to making pottery on the wheel. And I loved, I loved it. And I realized after a certain point that one of the reasons that I loved it was that I could see what I was making. I could touch mm -hmm. it. I could when I finished it, it was something that I could still hold. And there was something that I really um, appreciated about the tangibility of it. And it sort of helped me, I think, uh, yeah, it helped me process the idea that, oh, wait, but what I do all day, every day is literally the opposite of that. Like it, um, I mean, yeah, I mean, I think there's something incredibly beautiful about that also, but it can be very frustrating. It can be kind of like, um, you're only as good as your last performance, right? Like, um, and so you, it's hard to, I mean, recordings, of course, um, exist in that way, but yeah, I think there's something for me, I've always liked doing a little bit of both, something that's very tangible and something that's very intangible. Um, I mean, frankly, psychiatry is a little bit like that too, not to Mm -hmm. too many directions at once yeah no I, uh, but yeah having a therapeutic relationship with somebody is completely intangible um mm -hmm. and so sometimes now too i still find myself drawn um to you know when i'm really needing to unwind or something i think um turning to something in the visual arts is still sometimes more of a, an instinct first because um because of that there's some balance there. Mm -hmm. Do you feel like, um, uh, one thing that I was reading, you know, we talked about when you were in medical school and still performing and trying to find the balance there and how your life was very structured, which made you more efficient in both of those ways. And, um, you know, down to the point of each minute being sort of, you know, kind of prescribed. Um, what are the ways in which, when you went to your music and it gave you a chance to get out of that brain where you were studying medicine, did it literally, does it feel like a whole different muscle for you, a whole different, does it literally feel left and right to you? Um, um, it's such an interesting question because that has evolved so much over time. So I will say in medical school, for sure, um, it was very separate. I mean, I wouldn't say, I, I don't know that I, I'm not necessarily left and right, but they were completely separate. Um, mm -hmm. because medical school, especially the beginning is really just so much, um, it's so much memorization. It is not, um, yeah, it's just, and that really surprised, mm -hmm. it surprised and really upset me, I think, when I started. Um, but yeah, so I think they were very separate at that point. Um, as I advanced in my medical training, it started to cross over a little bit more. So certainly mm -hmm. in my work as a psychiatrist, and specifically, I think, in a psychoanalytic context, um, it becomes much more similar where there is a sense of improvisation, there's a sense of intuition, a sense, some of these other 
things that are much more similar across the process, you know, between the, between the two things. But initially, for sure, in medical school, very separate. It was just a very, um, and I think very early on in medical school, it was also sort of my old self and my new self kind of thing. There was also that. Um, and I think it was important sometimes to have Sometimes I would play because, um, you know, the beginning parts of medical, you and I have talked a lot about imposter syndrome, you know, over, mm -hmm. and we'll come back to it up at some point, but I think it was important for me to have mastery over something when I was starting medical school because I felt so the opposite of that. So I, I would say some of the contrast was in that too. It was nice to come back and do something that I'm like, oh, I actually, I, I know how to do this. Mm -hmm. um, and so that was, that was a nice, and it's something that I, I suggest to medical students all the time. It's important to have something, have something from your pre-medical school life that you come back to that where you feel like yourself, where you feel like you know what you're doing. So you remember what that feels like when you're just in the in the woods, right? In the weeds or whatever the expression mm -hmm. is, um, mm -hmm. where you're just, everything is so new and it's coming at you. That fire hose um, expression is really apt. Um, so yeah, um, but I would say it was very separate <laughs> for sure. At what place were you, I, I think I read something about, um, you know, you were starting to feel some repetitive, maybe repetitive injury or whatever. And then just the being on the road and being, by yourself and that's what you were doing. Was that the beginning of your thinking about, okay, um, you know, I'm gonna pursue this baccalaureate, I'm gonna try to go into another area. Um, was it was it the was it loneliness? Was it wanting to be on a team? It was all of those things. So yes, that definitely was the beginning of how I started to think about doing something different. I mean it was frankly, a very long and messy and ugly process of getting to the actual switch. Um, but yes, it was, that was the beginning of things. And I think honestly, the loneliness really is kind of at the key. I mean, I would say the loneliness and then the possibility of continuing to battle my body, I think for decades mm -hmm. to come was definitely, I, I would say those two things. Um, and I would say it was a dual loneliness. I mean, it is, it's a lonely life being, it can be a lonely life being on the, being on the road. I mean, it's amazing being with the colleagues that you're with when you're doing a particular concert or show or whatever, but it's difficult to maintain your home relationships. I think when you're on the road a lot, which I think a lot of my um, former colleagues can really attest to, but I think for me, there was also kind of a professional loneliness, you know, by the time I, um, I, I ended up having a very particular kind of career. Chamber music was my first love. I mean, it still is in terms of being a classical musician. Um, and I had the amazing opportunity to play with a lot of different groups. You know, at some point I was the kind of like the second violinist who, if you're a second violinist, either had a baby, got injured, <laughs> whatever. Um, I, I was that person that, that filled in <laughs> in a couple of cases, which is great. I and mean, there's something so rich about seeing how lots of different groups rehearse. It's all, every group has is its own ecosystem. So it was mm -hmm. so, um, it was really wonderful to, to do that. But the flip side of it is that I wasn't, um, I wasn't building something with my own, you know, I wasn't, I didn't have a, I didn't have my tribe that I was like building something with. Right. And, um, and so would I have done something else had I ended up with that? It's, it's hard to know, but I mean, I think there was that dual sense, that pull to be on a team and to be um, building something and, and, and to do it with the same people over time. I think that's something that I, I, I really wanted. Um. You talk about specifically loving new music. Um, that is, and is that what? What is it about creating new music or in in that world of of violin? Is it the improvisational nature of it? Is it the? Yeah, what is it? <laughs> I think it's the. Um, I think again, it's this really. It's it's a really deeply collaborative process. I mean, all chamber music is that way, but um, with young composers, or I should say with alive composers, um, there's just a real, 
it's a different kind of collaboration and it's, and it's, there's, it's, it's an aliveness that's different. The piece is literally um, transforming through the process of our learning it and playing it together. And that I think is just, it's fantastic. It's just nothing is, um, it's just so exciting to me. And it's also really, re really, really exciting to me to understand and have the opportunity to ask a composer, why this and not that? Um, and likewise to say, this is very easy on the violin. This is very not easy. <laughs> so how badly do you want this to happen? Mm -hmm. And to be able to kind of, um, you know, so there's a lot of really um, two-way learning and teaching and understanding. And um, I've learned, I've become such a better musician from working with composers because um, they have to think about music in a much, um, much, much different way. You know, they're, they're not, they're not, um, they're not sort of encumbered by having to also be technicians at their instruments. They have to mm -hmm. understand deeply a lot of different instruments, but they're able to zoom in and out in a way um, to music that um, I kind of, I don't know, I, I think I always envied in a way. So to be a part of their process and um, I, yeah, I, I just think it's a, just one of the most deeply satisfying kinds of collaborations. Um, when you were working as a solo artist or, or you were traveling and you, you know, that sense of isolation, were there challenges that you would set up for yourself each performance or each week? Or was there sort of a, a thinking through, like in order to, to keep yourself challenged or was it really just throwing yourself into the experience each time and just seeing where that took you? Is that, is, is I think is it that was the more the latter. I mean, just to, I, I never felt I never needed to throw additional challenges in there. I mean, just to do the work, I don't know, just to play the piece that I was hired to play at any given time at the level that I wanted to was more than challenging enough and I, I rarely did it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, so uh, yeah, I think it was really about, um, really about kind of what you said, yeah, throwing, throwing oneself into whatever performance that you're mm -hmm. um that you're at and and i i will say that i i didn't have a long enough career that because I, I hear people talking about this like what's it like to play a brahms brahms symphony for the 40 400th time or whatever uh maybe that's the, these are the wrong kinds of numbers but however long however many times you played over the course of a 25 30 year career i i don't i don't have that perspective and i i wonder if maybe some of those artists do have to make some sort of extra challenge for themselves but for me it was yeah it was it was hard enough just to just to learn my part and and play it without um feeling really badly after yeah I was gonna I was gonna go back to that did, did you often feel like you came off stage or in the middle of a show and you're just like ah. I mean how is that process for you do you let it go or is it do you evaluate and, and think about yeah gosh I really didn't quite hit the mark on that and are you able to be specific about where and you know is it uh, I guess is is the is the gauge you're using an overall gauge or does it become very specific about that phrase that you know that yeah period? it's it's always very specific um and unfortunately um that that highly critical voice does not go away at least for me um it's shifted a little bit now that i think it's not now that playing concerts is not my livelihood i have a very different relationship with it i think i um the inner critic has chilled out a little bit because of that or i think for a number of reasons but um certainly when i was working as a musician that critic was alive well very active very specific <laughs> um at the end of and the, ch the challenge really is to wait until you're off stage to let that voice have have a real mm -hmm. impact because yeah it can definitely it is not helpful um if if that's um, right. you, you can't create i mean i think there is actually some actual research about this that you can't um, or at least you can't improvise and be highly critical simultaneously like the brain yeah. is not wired kind of that way <laughs> um but yeah unfortunately for for me and i think for at least almost everybody that i know who plays at a very high level it's very um that doesn't go away i think the question is what do you do with it right because mm -hmm. there's you have a choice point you can either decide that 
um, you're terrible, you should quit and you should do something else. Or you decide, okay, well, um, clearly that's my, that's my guidepost for the next thing I need to do. Um, mm -hmm. I remember I played, um, I was in the orchestra for a concert, for um, a concert that we played with the violinist Midori. And I was amazed because, I mean, this was, she was uh, well into, I mean, this was not that, it was maybe 10 years ago. So she was, you know, well into her, a very established career. And it blew my mind. She was constantly perfecting every, she was, she was mm -hmm. practicing all the time. She was practicing. Um, and I just thought she's just, it's relentless. This relentless pursuit of excellence, this relentless pursuit of, um, yeah. So I think for everyone somewhere in there, um, that critic sits there and you can either take the Midori route and just keep letting it make you better and better and better, um, or it can crush you. Um, mm -hmm. Now you, uh, let, let's go to, I have a couple of questions over here that I'm, that I'm definitely want to get to yeah, sure. swing back around and get back into medical school. And uh, so you're in medical school, you're performing and you're also, and you're also in school and taking, you know, um, doing performances when you can. When did, when in medical school did you start to have a leaning towards psychiatry? Um, I would say it sort of came in and out. Um, early on, I think um, in some of my clinical rotations, I really, I'll say, I'll say a couple of things. One, I was, I was very drawn to two seemingly opposite things. So I was drawn to sort of primary care specialties. I was drawn to primary care, uh, family medicine, pediatrics, um, just in that ability to, um, to get to know patients and that spending time with them and understanding who they are as people is part of how you treat them better medically. Like that was always very attractive to me, but I also loved surgery. I loved being in the OR. I really, really liked that. Um, ultimately I decided I didn't like it so much that I was willing to give up everything else. Um, because I, I do think that is a little bit, or that's my, that was certainly my perception in medical school that that was a necessity for being in that sort of a specialty. Um, but, um, what ended up happening for me was my psychiatry rotations were kind of later on in, in my, uh, like third, but my clinical years. And that sort of sealed it, like once I actually was doing psychiatry. So I would say in my third year, somewhere in my, towards the end of my third year, I was pretty sure that I was going to go into psychiatry. What was that about surgery that, what, what was the thing you brought away from that that connected you to it? Um, I think a couple of things. I think one is that they have the joy and privilege of like trauma surgery, right? So much of, so much of, sorry, I'll string, I'm thinking too many things at the same time. Um, so much of medicine is difficult in part because um, we don't often get to see people get better quickly, right? Like it happens over time or sometimes it doesn't happen at all or sometimes best case scenario, you're really just stopping something terrible from happening. Um, and trauma surgery, for example, is the opposite of that. Somebody can come in after a traumatic accident of some sort, a team rushes in, um, the, the trauma surgeries do their thing. The next morning you round on the patient, they're pink and sitting up and talking to you. That's amazing. That is like a, that's truly, truly amazing. So there was something about that, I think, um, and then just being in the OR, like there's something, it's so, um, it's, there's almost a, I don't want to say church quality to it, but there, it's so organized. It's so controlled. Mm -hmm. um, a ritual in a way. It, yes. Right? Thank Theatrical, you. theatricals better. too. Yes. But, yes. right, everything needs to happen a certain way in order. Yeah. And of course I'm drawn, you know, I'm not as a musician, I'm drawn to, I'm drawn to the idea that you can um, really hone a, a skill that I like working with my hands. And I, mm -hmm. I like, um, you know, I, I like all the things that are required to all of those little skills that you have to master. Um, 
and there's an art to it. There's such a, there's such an art to doing procedures in a different way. So I think that was, there was, that was a lot of it um, for me. I think one gains the art part of it when you're in medical school. Is that just something that you already come into with it? Or do you believe, and we'll get into the, the workshops um, that you're doing as well, like students, other other students or other residents with you, I mean, uh, I'm sure there are a lot of residents who are uh, equally artistic and pursuing artistic things, but do you think that it is it is something that can be taught, how to bring the art over to that work? Oh, I absolutely think it can be taught. I think that, um, and I think it's an important piece of I don't know, my, my hope is to be involved more in, in medical education as I progress in my own career. And I absolutely think that can be taught. I think it can be modeled and I think it can be taught. It just has to occur to you to think about it like that. Um, mm -hmm. And I think that's a big piece of it um, because it does require a certain kind of very analytic thinking to master the basics, to understand enough basic science in order to understand the why of what you're doing um but i think it's not different from learning your scales on your instrument and learning your inst like you can't say the things you want to say with your instrument if you don't have a foundation if you don't have a solid technical foundation and medicine is exactly the same way um and it's in both cases can be very painful to acquire those skills like very <laughs> very painful um but you can't do it without it you can't you can't get to the art part without the craft part. You have to, um, but I do absolutely think it can be taught. Um, when you say it can be painful getting there, what, what do you mean by that? It's just making mistakes along the way, is that? Or? Well, that's a huge piece of it, which, um, but I mean, just that um, sort of what I was saying, alluding to before, like the beginning of medical school, mm -hmm. you're just a little memorization machine. It is not the life of the mind. You are not being asked to think in an original, um, even analytical way actually it's just you know here's this gross anatomy book it needs to somehow be in your head <laughs> mm -hmm. um and i remembered being like really kind of angry about it at the time but even by the time i was a third year medical student i was like oh well there's no way like, like you just have to know it you just have to know this stuff and there isn't sometimes there isn't a fun easy creative way to, to do it. Um, but you will do fun, creative, wonderful things with that information. Um, but yes, I think the acquisition, the standardized exams, the ways, I mean, look, are there more efficient ways that that can be done? Of course. I mean, I think there, um, I would love for kindergarten teachers and people who do a lot with how people acquire information. I, I would love for them to come together more with medical educators. Mm -hmm. um, so of, of course there's way, there are ways to do it better, but I think there is a certain kind of um, acquisition that, that can be very painful and difficult, um, but is, I, I don't really see a way around it. Um, Mm -hmm. Going that route. I'm going to take a, a big leap back, but that's to your studies um, with Suzuki training. Mm -hmm. And I, I'm just interested to know, uh, it's a very specific way of, is it is it training children or is it all musicians? Um, I mean, I think it was it initially Shinichi Suzuki, who developed the method um, in Japan, it was not initially... Um, it was for all children. It was part of a general education. Um, and to all of my Suzuki colleagues, if I'm saying wrong things or forget things, I'm so sorry. It's been many years. Um, but yes, my, I, my recollection of it is that it, it was for all children. Um, and it was really a way of learning to learn. Um, and it was the idea that you could teach children to play music in the same way that they learn language. Um, and that, of course, suggests many things, right? It suggests that there is similar to the way that there is a capacity to learn language that in every kid, that there is a capacity to learn music in every kid with enough, um, if you expose them, if they're listening to enough music um, and if they're taught to play little step by little step which is kind of how we whether we consciously do it or not how we teach kids to speak language we don't come to them and say 
here is a novel. Let's start with this. <laughs> um, but a lot of teaching systems will do that. And the Suzuki method is, uh, I think some of its brilliance lies in, I would say two pieces. One is that kind of growth mentality. You all have the capacity to do this. So mm -hmm. it just needs to be presented to you in very digestible pieces that you add together piece by piece. Um, and also this idea of immersion. If you're surrounded by beauty, surrounded by beautiful music and hearing it over and over, um, it just, it, you, absorb, you absorb a lot of it. Again, like we learn language. Um, mm -hmm. So yeah, I would say that sort of building block idea and then this growth mentality, this idea that what is talent? Um, you know, uh, I, I think it challenges that question a lot. As to whether it's just innate and something that you either have or don't have or something that if you're presented with a certain number of steps, you can allow that talent to right. flourish. Right, right, right. Yeah. Do you think that if you had gone to medical school right out of, um, right out of, Right. If you had been a young med student, would your experience have been um, very different? Yes. Do you imagine? I think, it, I think it would have been very, very different. I think, um, you know, I think about where, you know, speaking of the inner critic that we were talking about, I think about where I was with that in my early 20s. And I think I would have had a very difficult time with medical school because of that. It's, mm -hmm. it's, um, it's there are a lot of similarities, frankly, between conservatory training and um, and medical school. And I think having some of the perspective, I think that I had, um, I struggled a lot with standardized exams um, all the way through. Get you know in in the science courses that I took before medical school, in medical school, I, I found it's just not something that comes very easily to me. Um, and I think that I just wouldn't have had the perspective of, um, of sort of even being able to recognize that process of, oh, wow, I'm being incredibly, I'm being incredibly critical and it's actually not helping me learn. It is getting in my way, that sort of thing, mm -hmm. which is something that I learned from years of fighting with myself as a musician. Um, and I think that really helped. Um, and it also helped that by the time I got to medical school, I, I wasn't trying to be, um, I was really interested in finding something that had a resonance for me. I wasn't trying mm -hmm. to be the best of, I was going to work as hard as I could, but I, I don't know, I had different goals. And I, I don't know that that would have been the case um, when I was younger. There's a question uh, from, uh, from Joe here. He's a retired professor of uh, emergency medicine and saying med me medical training starts with an unconscious, in an unconscious incompetence that quickly becomes conscious incompetence the scariest part but the best incentive to learn then slowly becomes conscious competence and eventually after many years becomes unconscious i can't even get to oh, that's language. fantastic <laughs> unconscious sorry joe competence. it ends up being a thin line between dunning kruger and imposter syndrome is music similar um yes I, I, I love all of those stages because I do think that it's so similar to, I think it's so similar to music. Um, and I think it is, um, you fight different battles at different times, you know, it's sort of what we were talking about before. Like, I, I don't know, I can't speak to what it's like in either field of what it's like to get to a place where, um, what did he say? Where it's that where where the ability the ability and the confidence is Unch unconscious unconscious competence. Yes, uh, oh confidence. Yes, the mm -hmm. unconscious competence. I mean, I can't I can't wait. I'm so excited. <laughs> <laughs> I can't wait to get to that. <laughs> um, I mean, I guess I I came closer to that as a musician than in you know than in medicine. But I think that the pull is in different ways, right? Like when you're. Um, you just have such different tasks at every phase, right? I mean, I, I have to imagine when you get to that place of um, unconscious competence, then it is sort of what you were talking about before. I, I imagine you might look for more challenges. You might look for ways to um, push your, push your mm -hmm. knowledge and things like that because doing your job day to day doesn't push you the way that it, that it used to um, when you didn't have that confidence and every day you were like, Oh God, <laughs> please don't let this go wrong. <laughs> um, we just, still where I'm kind of at now. Um, so yeah, I, I think that's such a beautiful way to put that. And I think there are a lot of similarities. 
So jotted a note here. It takes five to 10 years to get to unconscious competence. So thank you for, <laughs> I, all, for all of us that are starting out <laughs> on growing gardens or whatever that, yeah. that challenge may be. Um, <laughs> I want to talk about a place that we connected not long ago, and it's when you were planning some workshops for Jefferson Medical College and also up at Presbyterian. And, and, and the topics I think we talked about were making mistakes in imposter syndrome. And I'm interested in knowing, is this born out of uh, your personal experience? Was it observational of other people? I'm sure it's probably a combination of both of those things. And, and, what, and, and there must be a real need there to feel like we, we need to address this, or we, I somehow could make could help this. Is, yeah, is that the... I think it's, again, it's, 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 it's all of those things. Um, I, um, the workshops first were, I guess, sort of born when I was a third, I guess I was a third year medical student. Um, and somebody from the Gold Humanism Society asked, uh, they wanted, they were doing the regional conference at Jefferson and somebody asked me, can you put something together using music and burnout. Um, and so, yeah, I think very early on, I was thinking about the factors that contribute to trainees and burnout. Um, and uh, yes, I think this, this, you know, medical school is such public learning um, every step of the way. Uh, well, not, I guess when you're preclinical, it's not, but um, once you're, once you're on the wards and taking care of patients, um, or part of the patient care team, it's all, you know, the, the quote unquote pimping that you see on television, that's, that, that happens. It's, that's part of, that's part of your, your training. And I both experienced, I think, as a student and, um, and saw over time, just that there can be a lot of, depending on how it's done, um, there can be a lot of shaming in it. There can be a lot of, um, a couple of things, a lot of shaming and that leads to a lot of, um, people are not willing to take risks. You're not willing to risk saying the wrong thing. Um, and so what happens gradually is that I know for myself, there are many times when, I myself would not risk saying the wrong thing, but it would be much more helpful for my learning for me to say the wrong thing, have somebody correct me in the moment. Um, but I think what I, and I, I, I think a lot of medical students do is will say, well, I don't wanna say the wrong thing in front of everybody right now. So I'm gonna keep my mouth shut, let somebody else take, take it and I'll, or I'll look this up later or something like that. There's sort of a, but so that's you're not, not sure, you're not sure, like you don't want to be wrong. Right. You don't want to be you wrong. Are wrong. Right. right. And you certainly don't want to be wrong in front of all of your classmates and colleagues and whatever. Um, and um, so, yeah, I, I thought about that. Um, and I think just in doing creative work, you know, you can't, create anything without making lots and lots and lots of mistakes and, and not just technical mistakes, but you have a vision and it's totally wrong. <laughs> and you don't know that until you, you've really put a lot of effort into it. And then you're like, oh man, that was not the wrong way. That was not the right way to go, except that that process taught you something deeply important about the next thing. Right. And so mm -hmm. I think the appreciation of, um, appreciation of that process, um, came to mind and um i think i've lost track of the question at this point. no you uh, we were just <laughs> talking about the workshop no no how you got onto yeah. imposter and how you got onto and and on to making mistakes so i'm curious to know what kinds of things did you do in the workshop to to sort of execute that or to get to the root of that yeah so what happens in the workshop is that first of all um sort of a a petting zoo of all of these instruments that are very simple. They're like the kinds of instruments that we all played on uh, a whole tambourine all, that many people played on. What? A tambourine. Yes, a tambourine, oh, wood blocks, <laughs> sand, sand, <laughs> sand blocks, um, things that um, lots of wood, wood and metal, things that very, very um, 
simple instruments that maybe kids would play on in music class back when that was a thing in school. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and so the idea is no, absolutely no musical experience is necessary. And I think the less, the better actually. Um, and basically I would divide up the students into quartets, trios and quartets, so groups of three and four, and they would um, stick together for the whole workshop. Um, and I would you know, take them through very basic with a lot of you know, call and response modeling stuff, just basic sort of um, parameters that they could use, um, you know, different, uh, it, it, yeah. And so they, but the idea is that they have a very short period. I give them some tools and then they give them a short period of time in which to compose a piece. They have to come up with a piece that has a beginning, a middle and an end. Um, and they have not enough time to do it. I've done that on purpose. They, they don't have enough time to feel comfortable and to rehearse and to practice it a whole bunch of time. So what happens as a result? It means everybody makes a bunch of mistakes. Um, mm -hmm. But it also means, first of all, they're experiencing those mistakes in community. There are, nobody is performing individually. They're playing as a trio. So first of all, that changes everything. Um, and secondly, it's presented as improvisation at the very beginning. The first thing I say is we're going to all make lots of mistakes. We're going to lean into these mistakes. It's going to feel really uncomfortable. Um, but sometimes when you make a mistake and this happens frequently in any, I think in any kind of improvisatory process, what is initially a mistake, mm -hmm. the correcting everybody, you know, what, what frequently at, at every workshop, this, the following happens one group will have an experience where one person makes a mistake as in it's not what they planned to do. They played something different than what they had rehearsed and what they had initially planned to do. And what happens is people respond to that. People, oh, that person didn't do that. I guess I, I need to do something else. The group rallies around them and then they finish their performance and they say, that was actually better than the thing that we planned. <laughs> right. So I don't know if that gives It some... does, yeah. So I, I'm fascinated with this idea of, of like a wood block and then making a mistake with a wood block. Are you like hitting it not enough times or hitting it you know, too many times? Or is it more just that what you said, like people are expecting somebody else to jump in with that thing or yeah, that, well, that sequence and they don't? And then they're like, oh, where's right. the sequence? Right. So well, like this when is... you're on stage. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's very similar. And although it, it made me think of some, one of my, I think one of my other favorite parts of doing this workshop is that people very quickly get very, um, and I think, again, this speaks to an innate create capacity that people have, um, regardless of what they tell themselves, but people have a vision. People mm -hmm. have um people have a real idea of what their piece should sound like. They only have, again, they, they've not met each other. They only have 10 minutes and it always amazes me how, so that's a part of it. Like they have a collective vision of what they, um, they're creatively invested. They have, mm -hmm. they have a strong idea of what they, they want. Um, and yeah, somewhere in there, somebody is supposed to do something at X time. Um, mm -hmm. and they'll get nervous or they'll forget or they'll get distracted. All the reasons that we all make mistakes, mm -hmm. um, these things will happen. So yes, it can at the, in the exact moment translate into they hit the thing at the wrong time or hit it not the right number mm -hmm. of times or whatever. But I think it's actually often born out of, uh, they, they have a concept. Um, and it always impresses me. People are so imaginative in what they do. Um, and, and, more recently we've been doing it on zoom so i don't give them instruments they have to mine their homes and apartments <laughs> for <laughs> instruments they have to you know make something with their kitchen implements like a, like a colander and a and yeah a, you think exactly that, i'm wondering because we talked about this a little bit before do you think that being on zoom somehow allows them a, a sense of privacy or a little bit more freedom have you noticed that at all that like okay i'm not in the room with these people so i can be a real i can really go to town with the colander and nobody's gonna know or i, I mean i i i haven't done it i mean i've only had a chance to do one of them on zoom um but i i think that is really true i, I think there is a a freedom that Zoom actually, because yes, because everybody's not in the room together, people can be a little bit less inhibited. Mm -hmm. And I also think that the breakout room, the breakout room mm -hmm. in um, on Zoom allow the groups to rehearse and discuss their process in total privacy. 
And I do think that that has an impact on, because we also, I should say, and I think this is sort of answering an earlier question that you asked, the workshop is a mix of, you know, banging on pots and having a great time, but also it's highly reflective. So we talk about, well, what did it feel like in your body when you made, when you made a mistake in your performance? What did it feel like to have your classmate right there with you, you know, as you were making a mistake um, and rallying around you, all of these things. So they're constantly, I'm constantly getting them or hopefully encouraging them to reflect on the process. Um, so, and I do think that doing that in private, because um, mm -hmm. when I run the workshops, I, I frequently circulate, um, which I had always done to be helpful to make sure that pe sometimes people do get overwhelmed by the instructions. Cause like I said, they're sort of purposely made, I sort of purposely structured it to make people a little bit uncomfortable, mm -hmm. um, but also to give them a real, you know, to, to also give them a task that has um, some structure to it so they're not totally lost. Um, I circulate, but I, I don't do that in the, in the Zoom breakout mm -hmm. rooms. I let them really have their, their trios really are their trios. Um, and then we, we collectively, we, we then all come together and share what, what was this like for you? Um, and so, yeah, I, I think that there is something about, I mean, it'll, I'm continuing to discover it as I'll do more of the workshops on Zoom, but I do think there's, I, I was so terrified, honestly, to do the first one on Zoom because I thought, how is this, how is this going to work? Um, and there are challenges, like they can't, two people can't play at the same time on Zoom. Mm -hmm. It has to all be kind of a conversational style of playing. Mm -hmm. They have to take turns. Um, but there are so many ways to, in some ways, um, you know, I think the more constrained the improvisation is actually, the more freedom that they'll feel less, uh, there's actually a freedom in that. So it's not mm -hmm. the worst thing. But yeah, I do think there's an intimacy and a privacy um, that, that, Zoom provides. that Zoom provides that I'm, I'm really grateful for. What about the, um, when you're doing it in person, this sort of ability to get into the body a little bit more, like, do you find people really get, like, is, is that an aspect, do you think, of dealing with, you mentioned uh, when someone, you, you would say to someone, hey, do you, or where do you feel that shame, or do you feel that shame in your body? Do you yeah. think that it's a question of connecting the mind and the body um, to, to those experiences to, to help them live through it so they see that it's like not the worst thing in the world? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I think, um... Yeah, I mean, in, in the workshop and um, and in other contexts too, I, I, I do encourage people to ground in their felt experience. I think that if that can be such a powerful way to, um, to experience something, good or bad, right? Um, positive or negative. Um, and so I do, I do call people's attention to that a lot in the workshops. Because I think in the moment, people, myself included, when you're having a moment where you've made a mistake and you're full of shame <laughs> and regret or whatever intense emotions come up in that, in that moment, um, it's very easy to be caught up in whatever story you're telling yourself about that moment. Mm -hmm. Right. And I think there can be moments if you can just drop down and, and it's hard. I don't pretend that this is in any way easy, but if you can even notice, oh, well, when I do this, my, my face totally flushes or my heart's beating really fast. It feels like it's going to beat out of my chest. Um, it can be, I just, even noticing that I think changes, um, it changes the experience. Um, because you live through it, you, you, you get through it as opposed to your fear about what that's going to mean. Right. And, and right. you find that people are fine with that? Or? Well, it's also just, um, I think, I don't know if people are fine. With, I, I don't know if anyone is fine with that, right? It's, it's, mm -hmm. it's, so, it's so difficult. But what I want people to start to cultivate is an awareness that it's a process and it's a consistent process, right? That, I mean, within ourselves, we're consistent. The way, mm -hmm. um, you know, when I make this kind of mistake, I tend to react like this. And understanding how you first react to a mistake, again, sort of gets back to that choice point, right? Um, when you've made a mistake, um, there are, once it's already happened, you have many options for how to proceed. Um, and I think the more information you have about yourself, um, about what thought process goes through your mind, specifically when, um, 
each individual person is going to have a very different story, right? Based on their past and based on their ideas of what success is, all of these things. Um, and, um, but the more that you know yourself in that moment, the more you have some choices, then you have, then you have some options in terms of, and you're not just kind of um, at the mercy of this overwhelming experience where you just, all you register is that you are less than, right? Mm -hmm. um, and so the idea is in the workshop, I want people to start to observe that making mistakes is a process and making mistakes is a necessary process to all learning. Mm -hmm. um, and so best to get to know yourself. What, what kind of mistake maker are you? What kind, of react, what kind of reactions do you have to your own mistake making? And how can we kind of be friends with that? Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, making friends with that. It seems like shame is at the root of so much of what drives us to avoid and, and want to avoid making mistakes. And um, is the workshop or is, is the, the attention to the imposter syndrome a, a different set of exercises that you use um, in, in those workshops or is it just an, is it sort of an adjunct part of making mistakes? Um, I think it just, uh, the essential structure of the, um, it's funny, that's such an incisive question <laughs> because it really gets to the heart of my own, like how I create each workshop. So I do, it's a little bit of both. So I do try to create musical activities that will in some way, um, it's very, everything is completely deliberate. So mm -hmm. I, I've structured the, I've structured it musically. So people will tend to make a certain kind of mistake. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like I'm showing my underwear or something here. So yeah, so it's, uh, everything is highly crafted to, um, and again, it's, it's going to be highly individual. I've been wrong. Um, mm -hmm. It's my own mistake making process, but yeah, so the, the workshops are musically, they, they'll go through certain musical activities that are likely to um, elicit certain experiences. Um, and, um, but I would say in terms of, because there are different kinds of mistakes they can make, right? And there are different mm -hmm. kinds of mistakes that are going to happen between people in a group. And um, so I will capitalize on that as a way of talking about the analog in a clinical setting, right? What's the, because there are different kinds of mistakes there too, and there's lots of parallels. So the imposter syndrome though is usually uh, an add-on, right? So we're in general in the workshop, in the, when we're sort of in it with the music, we're really talking about leaning into the discomfort of trying something new, mm -hmm. you know, venturing outside of your I mean by virtue of banging on a pot in front of a bunch of your friends like you're they're already I, you know I, I have so much respect for the people who sign up for the workshops because they're already pushing past their comfort zone right um but then the imposter syndrome is I think I, I spent a lot of time normalizing it because I think it's frequently shocking to people that other people I mean because the whole idea of it is it's very isolating you think you're the only one right I mean that's the mm -hmm. nature of imposter syndrome everybody else gets this except for me yeah um and so it's completely isolating and I think it's frequently there's this kind of palpable <sighs> when you kind of say oh you know I, I I make this joke frequently um which is, you know, in, in movies, in law school, they're, they're, you know, in law school movies, there's always look to your left, look to your right, you know, only one of you is going to make it through this, right? Um, and I always say, look to your left, look to your right, all three of y'all have imposter syndrome, right? Mm -hmm. Like, it's so pervasive, I think, in high achieving people. Um, but it's also like a such a dirty little secret. We don't, we mm -hmm. don't talk about it. We don't, um, it's, it's the nature of it. I mean, I think um, you and I earlier were re reflecting on some of Brene Brown's work, but I think um, speaking our shame totally changes the equation, right? Uh, being out in the open about imposter syndrome, being out in the open about how much shame is in a certain learning process is, um, I think, deeply relieving for a lot of medical students, especially at the beginning of their process. Um, you talked uh, earlier about wanting to find the healing. You wanted to be a healer and to use your art to do that. Do you feel, do you feel like in your workshops and just in your choice of, of making, um, you know, heading into psychiatry that you are on that road to find your tribe? 
Um, I certainly hope so. Um, I think that uh, the, the workshop has been a unique opportunity to combine the I guess the specific things, um, music in particular, and um, and sort of a, a therapeutic process. Um, but I think that more generally, I have been surprised. I I'll have to admit, you know, I mean, medical school and residency, it's a long process, and so you don't know um, what it's going to be like. On, and I still don't really know. Um, I'm not fully in practice yet. Um, but I think the work of being a therapist has had so many parallels with a both creative but specifically a musical process that have really surprised me um, i mean it's been a wonderful pleasant surprise um but yeah how this will all come together and what it will but i but yeah i'm not in my clinical work for the most part with the exception of this workshop i'm not like specifically pulling in you know uh musical elements per se it's they're still sort of uh parallel there are two parallel lives that i i still have mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. but um certainly the idea of creativity in clinical work i think is something that i i think about constantly and i do think i i do pull that into my clinical work um but it's less specific it's like less specific mm -hmm. to music and more about sort of a general i mm -hmm. I, I think i think constantly about the creative process and learning like what is it how do we yeah how do we learn better how do we therefore teach better um well dr beverly shin thank you for sharing i could continue to talk to you and, and want to talk to you and find out how your work at the university of washington is happening you'll be going out there in 2021 to work you're specifically working in the area of addiction is that correct yes that's correct so i'm i'm this fascinated about how art and and psychiatry work together and and i'm fascinated to hear what you discover along the way um and the ways in which you know you, you're using all of this to to do that thing you wanted to do which is to heal and to use your art and um and i just i thank you so much for being here on into the absurd and um I'm wishing you all the best and, and want to catch up with you. Thank you so much, Tina. And yes, we could talk. I feel like I could talk to you for, for hours. <laughs> There's <laughs> a lot. That. There's a lot. There's a lot. Those are the best questions. Yeah. I love. Oh, yeah. Oh. So I appreciate your help. Oh, me. no. So it's my pleasure. Yeah. Good luck. We'll, we'll catch up again. On all right. Sounds visit. great. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. And thanks to everybody for joining us this evening. Um, I do hope you'll... Um, be with us next Saturday when Nicole Taylor joins us. She is an author who has written a book called uh, A Joyful Pause, 52 Ways to Love Your Life. And it seemed like a wonderful time as we head into uh, just the holidays and 2021 that sort of connecting with our simplicity and um, the ways in which um, meditation and yoga and all the things that Nicole is has studied Ayurvedic medicine. We're all going to talk about all that next week and hopefully come out with some tools and ways that we can head into the holidays and next year feeling a little bit more centered and uh, armed uh, armed to, to do the work that we all have to do. So thanks so much for being here. We hope you'll share the word. Head on over to our YouTube page and subscribe while you're there. And please share the word with five friends. Uh, that don't know about the IRC. And even when we get back on the stage with you next year, we're still going to be uh, here on Into the Absurd. I want to thank Erica Holscher and Bob Schmidt this evening for always being steady technical assistance for us. And thank you so much for being here. You make Into the Absurd happen. And these are the stories that are, that are taking us through in very existentially challenging times. So we're wishing you the very best week ahead, very creative and a safe week. See you next week.